I'm Rabbi Ami Hirsch of the Stephen Wise Free Synagogue in New York, and you're listening to In These Times. The civil unrest in Israel today revolves around the recent judicial overhaul, what some are calling reform, others a coup. What we've been seeing is enough to cause grave concern. Hundreds of thousands of Israelis have taken to the streets every week since January. Altogether, over 7 million people. Economists predict dire consequences. Generals report degraded battle readiness as thousands of reservists refuse to serve. More than an issue of proper checks and balances, this is an existential crisis, unprecedented in all of Israel's history. And it threatens to tear the country apart from within. Here with me today is Daniel Gordis, ordained as a conservative rabbi. He founded the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies on the West Coast before making Aliyah in 1998. And since then, he's been an unabashed advocate for Israel. Today, he's urging us to get involved in ways he has never urged before. Daniel, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome to In These Times. Thank you very much, Rabbi Hirsch, for having me. Really an honor to be with you. I know it's no secret that I think your voice is an incredibly important one always, but particularly these days, so I'm grateful for it. Well, I feel the same, so uh, it's a mutual sentiment. Really, really, your voice is critical. It's been for many, many years, and especially now because times are fundamentally different. But let me ask you first, what brought you to Israel? When did you come? What were your motivations? And What did you expect to do, and are you doing what you expected to do? If I tell you the truth about why we came, you'll think I'm kidding, but my wife might listen to this, so I actually have to tell the truth. We got engaged, actually, in the middle of our junior year in college. That was 79, 80. I'm going to spare all our listeners the math. They're busy <laughs> scribbling away. So I'm 64. We came on our junior year because she was in college in Boston, and I was in college in New York, and we were already a thing and wanted to spend the year together. So we came to Jerusalem, and I proposed in the middle of the year at a place that's now the Eldon Carr rental agency across from the King David, but back then it was a nice restaurant. <laughs> she said yes, on condition that we live in Israel, which I was totally shocked by. And I was like, well, that's seriously not happening. We'd been here for a couple of years when I was a kid, and it was a very different country back then, but it, I just didn't love it. I came to Israel that year because she wanted to be here. Was she Israeli or? Uh... She was from Anaheim, California. It's about as un-Israeli as you can get, you know? She was a passionate Zionist. She was the real deal, yeah. Her sister, like say, they grew up behind the Orange Curtain in Orange County. So we agreed we'd take sabbaticals here. And long story short, we got married, we had a bunch of kids. We came in 98. Very early on in the year, she said, I don't want to go back. I, I want to stay. At first, I thought she was actually kidding, but I realized she wasn't. And the truth is, we had made a couple of moves for my career, and it was really her turn. And we were having a great year with our kids. And it's kind of funny to talk about this now, but that was right when Ehud Barak beat Bibi Netanyahu, and he made three promises, you know, out of Gaza, out of Lebanon, and peace with Syria. He didn't manage to do all of those things, but he got some of it done. He got us out of Lebanon. It was a, a euphoric period in Israel's history. It felt like an amazing time to join the country, and uh, our kids were thriving here. So we took the leap. We bought a fax machine, sold our house over a fax, <laughs> <laughs> and we've been here about 25 years. And what did you expect to do? I graduated JTS. I got ordained in 84, and then I worked as an assistant rabbi in a large suburban conservative synagogue in LA for a couple of years. I knew that synagogue life probably wasn't the ideal match for me, and I had other academic interests. So while we were still in L.A., I got a doctorate, and then I was teaching at the UJ and running the rabbinical school. What did I think I would do? I don't think I knew exactly what I would do. Am I doing what I thought I was going to? I, I, I never thought I would be doing what I'm doing now, not in a million years. But this whole idea of writing about Israel, and that was nowhere on the radar screen. It's been tremendously interesting, and I've learned a tremendous amount doing it. I think it's been helpful for my soul working out some of the difficult periods that we've been through, but I certainly had no expectation of doing anything remotely like that. Let's get right to the uh, topic that is on everybody's mind. What is important for American Jews to know about this whole judicial reform? Even, even the use of this terminology is very controversial. Correct. I mean, everything terminologically in Israel is complicated. So if you call it the West Bank, you annoy a lot of people who feel that that's Jewish territory and it was captured, and it was redeemed, it was liberated, and they call it Judea and Samaria. So if you try to appease them and you call it Judea and Samaria, then the people who are in the center on the left think that you're a hard right settler, right winger. Almost everything here is fraught. 
And so what we even call this whole process, you know, people used to call it judicial reform, but in a lot of circles in Israel now, it's being called the judicial coup. Those are powerful words, and whether or not it's intended that way, I think is a fair conversation to have. But at a certain point, I think it's not to say that what happens doesn't matter. What happens matters a tremendous amount, but in a certain way, and I want to make sure that I'm not taken out of context, in a certain way only, the whole judicial issue now is secondary to a larger issue, which is the huge split in the state of Israel. The anger, the uh, sense of dispossession by some. Ironically, I think both sides feel dispossessed. In other words, the, the people who voted for the government, who say, well, we voted and we won, and the government had a plan, you knew about it. That's not true, by the way. If you look carefully, Bibi Netanyahu mentioned judicial reform not one single time during the campaign. Not once. Mm -hmm. uh, Because it wasn't going to help him get elected. People on the right who wanted it were going to vote for him anyway. Some people on the left, he figured might vote for them, but not if he mentioned that. So he didn't talk about it. But they did win the election. I didn't vote for Bibi. I lost. You know, And I think the people who won have a right to feel, well, my coalition won. I should see some legislative results for that. And they are feeling now very disenfranchised because wildly unexpectedly, unexpected to be also, you know, at this point, the Israeli police say that 7 million protesters have been out there, obviously not 7 million different people. Mm. But if you count each person, each time they go to a protest, it's been 7 million people. Nobody expected that. Otherwise, they wouldn't have unfolded this thing in the way they did, right? They did it in a terrible way. I mean, had they unfolded it piecemeal, they might have gotten it through. Had they been more upfront about it, had Bibi given an address to the nation, had he stressed that certain individual and minority rights were going to be protected, but they were going to do this, it could have gotten through. And even the people on the right who write for newspapers like Makor Rishon, which is a right wing, but not far right wing, right of center, but by no means extremist, by no means and it has a variety of views, including Ari Shavit, who's a very well-known author in Israel, who's very much on the left, and Yair Sheleg, who's very much in the center. So it's a right-wing paper, but it has a wide array of voices that are represented. Even this right-wing newspaper, Malkor Rishon, says every week, my God, did they blow it. Every possible mistake they could make, they made. But that's why the right feels disenfranchised. The right feels we voted for this, we won. There's a legislative agenda. All of a sudden, everybody takes to the streets. What if there's a left wing or a centrist government and we lose and they do something we don't want? Are we going to go start blocking highways? Are we going to go start taking to the streets? I mean, what is this? You lost your election. Own up to it. But by the same token, the people in the center and the left, and this is really no longer left and right, it's left, center, and part of the right versus some of the right. They say, no, this is not a regular legislative issue. Even if you wanted to change something as dramatic as the law of return, we might like it, we might not like it, but it's a legislative issue. We lost the election. If you have the votes in the Knesset, you know, you can pass it. You want to change the tax code, you can change the tax code. You want to change the laws about uh, whatever, you can change the laws. You're the parliament, but you can't change the fundamental rules of the game without a wide consensus. You were elected with 48.4% of the popular vote. True, you have 64 seats in the Knesset as of today. But you were only elected with 48.4% of the popular vote. It was enough to get them a majority of 64 seats in, out of the 120 in the Knesset. And by the way, in certain Israeli terms, 64 seats is not a bad majority. But you can't call it a wide mandate. And what the people who are opposed to the judicial reform say are basically two things. Number one, if there are no checks and balances, and the legislative and the executive are already essentially wrapped into one, the prime minister and the Knesset, and you defang the other branch, which is the judicial, it doesn't live up to the expectations of any standard liberal democracy anywhere in the world. So don't pretend that democracy says you can do this. Democracy is much more sophisticated than majority rules. Majority rules is fourth grade democracy, right? Democracy is about protecting the rights of minorities, protecting the rights of individuals. So look, you know, Ami, you and I are both non-Orthodox rabbis, and we both care about the place of non-Orthodox Judaism in, in Israel. Uh, according to Israeli law, if they pass this reform, 61 votes in the Knesset, they can just say, you know what? We're closing every reform conservative synagogue in the country and every mosque. And then there's no judicial review. The Supreme Court can't say, no, you can't do that. Now, they would say, but wait, we wrote into the law that the next Knesset has to endorse that change or the change falls. Okay, but I want to wait three and a half years with every reform and conservative synagogue and every mosque closed. 
I mean, that's not how that's not how democracy works. So the first argument that those opposed to the judicial reform, judicial coup, et cetera, make is this is just not what a democracy, a liberal democracy is supposed to look like. And the second argument they make is, even leaving that aside, you can't change the rules of the game. That you don't get to do with 48.4% of the vote. You just don't. You need 60%, 70%, 80%. And that's what I think has the the those opposed to the judicial reform feeling disenfranchised. So what's going on in Israel right now, more important than the judicial issue, is that everybody feels disenfranchised. And that's very dangerous for the future of a shared society. Daniel, wasn't it the judicial measures, the proposals, they did awaken this passive Israeli street. Even Israelis who don't follow this closely, haven't studied constitutional law or jurisprudence into a real active resistance over something called an unreasonable clause. And then, of course, in the United States, we're having all kinds of conservative inclined uh, scholars who say, listen, the power of the Israeli Supreme Court is unlike any other court, certainly unlike the American court. And so how do you explain to American Jews what is at stake here? If it's just uh, something that has to do with jurisprudence and the relationship between the three branches of government. Why is that something that should so concern us here in the United States? I mean, it's not about a, a normal legislative question. If the Supreme Court does not have judicial review, then a majority of 61 members of the Knesset could pass any law they wanted, basically. Uh, they would need 80 votes in the Knesset, by the way, to change the laws of elections. But let's say they got 80 votes and there's no Supreme Court judicial review and they decide, actually, we're in the Knesset now. We're going to make elections every 10 years. You don't want a court that can strike that down. If they close all the reform synagogues, you don't want a court that can strike that down. What happens is, I think a lot of American Jews, and this is understandable, but just incorrect, American Jews are taking what they see as conservative-progressive divide and kind of superimposing it on Israel and saying, well, the court in Israel is supposed to be a left-wing court. Oh, my God, I know what left-wing means in America. You know, it means the very left-wing of the Democratic Party. That's the last thing that I want to see in Israel. So they say, so I'm actually a conservative in America. I would therefore be conservative Israel. That doesn't really work. In other words, American Jews would not want to live in a United States in which the Supreme Court could not overturn a rule of Congress. At the end of the day, you do want there to be checks and balances. So what I think American Jews who are opposed to the protesters need to understand is it's not about whether Israel should be a left-wing or a right-wing country. And I would think the people on both sides who've studied this would say, yes, the Israeli Supreme Court has too much power. But like anything else in life, you can fix a problem and make it worse. And yes, the Israeli Supreme Court has too much power. The Israeli Supreme Court should have some limitations on the application of the reasonability test. It should have some limitations on judicial review, but it should have some elements of the reasonability test, and it should have some elements of the judicial review. I think very foolishly, it went to the extreme on all four issues. And I'll just give you an example of the kinds of compromise that could be possible that I think would actually allow everybody to feel that they won. But part of the issue in this judicial reform, for example, is the makeup of the committee that selects judges in Israel. This committee actually selects all the judges in Israel, from local judges to regional judges to Supreme Court judges. And there are three members of the bar, judges and lawyers, who are not therefore elected. And the argument has been that they therefore had a veto on any judge who could be passed through because of the number of people in the committee. And they wanted it to therefore change the nature of the committee and basically give all the power to the government. So the government, meaning the Knesset, would have the coalition, it would pick the court, and the court wouldn't have judicial review because of another plank. There's just no limit to what the government could do. So it basically flips the unbridled power of the court and gives unbridled power to the Knesset. Now, some people say, yeah, but at least I voted for the Knesset. I didn't vote for the court. And the Knesset I vote for every X number of years, and I can get rid of them, whereas the court they serve for life until they're 67. So I, at least that's more democratic. But there's ways of fixing this that do not involve the pendulum going to one extreme or the other. You could keep the constitution of the court exactly the same, but say that you need seven of the members to vote for any given judge. That gives both sides a veto power. And that means that in the regular you know, what we call in the Talmud world, shakla vataria, the discourse, the back and forth, 
Either they're going to say, we have to appoint two judges. We'll vote for you on this one. You vote for us on that one. Or we're going to take more middle mainstream judges, whatever the case may be. You could see a world in which there is a limitation on judicial review, but not when it involves legislation that impinges on the fundamental rights of individuals or minorities. You could see a world in which there is a limitation on the reasonability test, but not having it eradicated completely. And again, none of us know what the court is going to do. But what I hope the court will see fit to do is to do something that is not one extreme or the other. One extreme would be, no, we're the court. We're overruling it. We're saying it's not constitutional. It's out. The reason the Knesset will go ballistic about that is because they made this what's called a basic law. And their argument is the Supreme Court has never overruled a basic law, and the Supreme Court does not have the right to overrule a basic law. If the court does that, then all the people who voted for the government will say, see, that's why we voted for the government. The court knows no limits to its own power. It's now taking powers it never even had before. It would be a mistake. By the same token, if the court sort of rolls over and plays dead and say, okay, you took away our reasonability test. What can we do? You know, you've spoken. I think people in the center and the left will feel, as my friend and colleague Yadidja Stern has put it, Hamivtsar nafal, the, the fortress just collapsed. What either side would do if they feel that they really lost this, it's very hard to say. The right wing has been very threatening and the left would say, or the left and center would say, we've been protesting. It didn't do any good. Well, then what do we do now? And that's a very, very dangerous question. So I would hope that they would do something in the middle. They could send it back and say, we actually have the following concerns about the legislation. Revise these areas with this in mind. Bring it back to us. They could say, we have a concern about the procedure by which the legislation was passed. So there's a few things that they could do in the middle that would either kick the can down the road or ask for a modified version. But literally, as you and I are speaking, I mean, this is literally unfolding as we speak. If the stakes are so high, and if politics is the art of compromise, and that's happened over and over and over again in the history of Israel, by and large, with positive results, Mm -hmm. why is compromise on this issue so hard to achieve? Because of the nature of Bibi's coalition, basically. Um, Bibi is not willing to lose his coalition because he won't be prime minister. Why is he so concerned about being prime minister? There's people who say... He wants to be prime minister because he believes that as long as he's in office, he can't be convicted in any of the trials for which he's being investigated for all sorts of corruption. So he's protecting himself. Other people say, no, he actually genuinely believes that he's the best person to run Israel. And he doesn't trust Gans. He doesn't trust Lapid. He certainly doesn't trust Matvich or Ben-Gvir or any of those people. So he really thinks, like, who else is there but me? That's a possibility. Another possibility, and I say this with no glee, and I say it with no triumphant satisfaction. Another possibility is that he's not well. I mean, it it, it looks like not the same BB to a certain extent. There are people much younger than him with a small fraction of his political talent who are running circles around him, not quite as much now as they were a couple months ago. But you would never have imagined that Smotrich and Benvir could control so much of this government, but he's allowed it. So part of it is that. Uh, Part of it is also, why is compromise hard? Because Smotrich and Benvir have said, if you compromise on this, you have no government. The Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, have said, if you do not pass that draft law saying that our young men do not go to the army ever and make it a basic law which can then not be changed, you have no coalition. Now, people are saying, well, then why doesn't Gantz go to Bibi, say to him, look, you and I are not the best of friends, to put it mildly, and the polls are showing that I could actually run and win, but I don't even need that. You can be prime minister, and I'll bring my party, we'll join your coalition, just shelve the judicial reform, shelve the Haredi draft issue. We won't do anything radical. You want to make peace with Saudi Arabia? That's great. You steer the ship. We're just going to steer the ship and I'll give you my votes. At the moment, at least, Gans is saying, I'm not going to do that because Bibi is a liar. I don't trust him. Bibi lied to me before when he and I were supposed to have a rotation and he tricked me and I look like an idiot and I'm not about to let the Israeli public think that I'm an idiot again. But one has to hope at this very moment that statesmanship will trump political interests, that Gantz would say to himself, look, my voters will forgive me. If I take the high road and I say to Bibi, no, I'm not going to take us to elections. You can be prime minister exactly like I said, 
the voters will forgive him. That many people in the Likud who will not vote for the Likud again, if this keeps getting worse and worse, if Bibi goes to the nation and he says, look, we're in a very tough spot here. We're forming a national unity government with Gantz and with Lapid. And if the Haredim drop out, fine. If Ben Greer and Smartrich drop out because their parties ran with Likud, fine. I still have more than 61 votes, many more than 61 votes. Um, that's what one has to hope, either the Supreme Court takes a middle-of-the-road position or that the political echelon takes a middle-of-the-road, because this is highly explosive, and this could go to a very, very, very dark place. I don't think it's going to, but there are nightmare scenarios here that are not hard to conjure, and they're not from La La Land. They are very real possibilities. I think the implication of your response is that there's something distinctive and different about some of the forces in the coalition government, the forces represented by Ben Gvir and uh, Smotrich. And were it not for them, politics could unfold in Israel more or less as they have up to now. Is that your view? A hundred percent. Look, I mean, I think that what Bibi did is he sold his reputation, unless he can pull out Saudi Arabia. That would be the huge coup. And there are some people here that think that actually that's what's motivating him now to try to make peace with Saudi or normalization with Saudi Arabia, because he knows that he's completely trashed his reputation and his legacy. One has to go back to the days of Menachem Begin, who founded the Likud party. Menachem Begin, you know, the great right winger, of course, who made peace with Egypt, was a liberal in the classic sense, a liberal in the Jeffersonian sense, a liberal who believed in the rights of minorities, a liberal who believed in the rule of law. He was in the West Bank actually inaugurating a new settlement when he got word that the, ju- the the Supreme Court had ruled that they couldn't build that settlement where they wanted to build it. And everybody was waiting for him to say, well, we're not going to listen to the Supreme Court. And his famous line was, Yesh shoftim Yerushalayim. There are judges in Jerusalem. Supreme Court has spoken. Although his politics tended right, he was a liberal in the sense that nobody was disenfranchised by his politics. Ben Gvir and Smotrich's anti-Arab sentiment is palpable. And they speak about the Palestinians that way, but then they always let it slip. Even people on the right never spoke this way before. And even people who may have thought this way Mm -hmm. knew that you couldn't talk that way. In fairness, this is changing all over the world, right? I mean, I was sitting in the very room where I'm speaking to you from, and my wife and I were watching CNN. This goes back a bunch of years. And it was the day that the story broke about the Billy Bush bus tape, right? Trump, you can grab her by, et cetera, et cetera. And I said to my wife, okay, that's it, it's over. He's, he's gone, he's finished. And she looked at me, she said, are you sure? I said, of course I'm sure. You can't be elected president of the United States if you talk that way. Well, it shows how much I know. But the notion of norms is, I think, being undermined in many Western societies. So part of it's that. But part of it is that these guys just represent something very, very, very ugly. The good side of this is that they have brought a huge swath of the Israeli political and religious spectrum together. I was just a protest Saturday night, a guy in black pants, white shirt, seat seat, hanging out, holding up a sign that said, Izunim Ublamim, checks and balances. I mean, clearly a Haredi guy, right? There are several dozen Haredi people at these protests. That's an extraordinary thing. There's lots of Likud voters at these protests. That's the good news. And the other good news, by the way, I really think, and I think it's unfortunate that we haven't seized on this as much and that the liberal Jewish community in America hasn't seized on this as much, you know, for very understandable reasons. Here was a moment to embrace the hundreds of thousands of people each week who are out there in the hot and in the cold, in the rain and in the dark and whatever. And for people in liberal synagogues to say, that's the Israel that we love. I mean, that's an unbelievable thing. A political scientist I was listening to this week said, this is the most protracted public resistance movement in the history of the world. More people, more percentage of the population, more weeks, more than Poland, more than Hungary, more than Turkey, which was very short. It set a new standard for what popular resistance can look like. Whether it's going to work in the end, I don't know. But If I were asked to speak to a liberal congregation in the States now, I would say, we're what you love. We're actually what you should be unbelievably proud of. We're what did not happen in Portland, and we're what did not happen in Seattle, and we're what did not happen in Hungary, and we're what did not happen in Poland. We are the very best of peaceful, 
mostly passive resistance, you should be embracing in front of your congregation the, the, the deep-seated democratic pluralistic impulse of this huge swath of Israeli society. There's been a lot of silence. and It feels sort of like rabbis who for decades have been sort of criticizing Israel over rabbinate, kotel, Palestinians, settlements, all of which I either agree or don't agree, but you can certainly understand it. They haven't figured out how to kind of switch their voice. And because of something unbelievably powerful that's happening here, this is the time to embrace Israel. You've been strong in pointing out where criticism of American Jews of Israel has been misguided. And now you're being criticized by the very people who held you up as a standard of how liberal Jews should relate to Israel, asking them now to be much more aggressively involved on what they argue is a partisan uh, issue. How do you respond to all of that? Help us, in particular, American reform rabbis and the leadership and the leadership of federations and Jewish defense organizations. What do you mean when you say get more involved? And how do you respond to your critics who were your strongest supporters as of six months ago? I'll start with something that you didn't mention. I think that those of us who've taken positions like mine have lost friends in this, have lost decades-long friendships. People have just turned around and walked away. And I, I said that with a broken heart. And, and I've written a couple of people and I said, really? We disagreed about, you know, like everything, Shabbat, God, Halakha, all of that. And our friendship never even hit a little ripple because of that. And now because of a political issue, you're going to walk away. There's a way in which this is so surprising to me. I think Americans experienced it in the previous administration. I read on the New York Times front page, you know, how to have Thanksgiving dinner with your family, you know, if they are Trumpers. And I would say to myself, really? You can't get together for Thanksgiving dinner and just put it aside? I, I was kind of stupefied, but I actually kind of understand it better now because I've had people literally walk away. And that's just very sad. And will some of these friendships be recouped afterwards? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe not. And that really, really, really breaks my heart. But look, Here's what I've been trying to say to American Jews before. We're, we're pounding Gaza, right? And the rabbis get up and say that Israel is, you know, showing no mercy. It's a merciless pounding of F-16s and F-15s and helicopters and drones on a poor, unprotected Palestinian population. That's all true. And then I would say to them, here's the only thing I ask you to ask yourself. Why are the liberals in Israel not protesting against that? but they're not really liberals. They don't really care about Palestinians. Like, you're more liberal than Israeli liberals. You're more of a progressive than an American progressive. You care more about Palestinians than Israeli social activists who've been working toward Palestinian issues their whole lives. So do you ask yourself when this is going on and you see nobody in the Knesset speaking about against what the government's doing, including Meretz, the most left-wing party that there is, most left-wing Jewish party. I asked my American progressive rabbi friends especially, Really? That doesn't give you pause? That even Israeli liberal rabbis, reform rabbis, conservative rabbis, there's secular rabbis here in Israel, by the way, they're not speaking out against it. What do you know that we don't know? Or are you not aware of the fact that the parents who are Meretz voters and the parents who are Likud voters are all holding their kids in the middle of the night in the same bomb shelters because they're firing rockets from Gaza? And we just don't know how to stop it except to pound them. Do we like pounding them? I mean, do I as an Israeli citizen like seeing those pictures on CNN or Fox or MSNBC when I watch them? No, it breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. So I'm not asking them to say, yes, we want the army to go ahead and pound them harder. But a certain amount of humility. So my argument is, has long been the relentless criticism of Israel comes from fundamentally in a position of American progressive models on Israel. And it doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit. If somebody was firing rockets from Tijuana at Los Angeles and they were killing real people and they were destroying real buildings, the left and the right would be united in saying to the American army, put a stop to that. But it doesn't happen, thank God. Now, this is different. And what have I said to people? What do I want people to do? I want my reform rabbi friends to get up in their synagogues and say, I have been for years criticizing Israel. And I still stand by what I said. I'm not changing my position, but I've always said we're criticizing with love. And here's the moment to talk about love. I want us to embrace 
those hundreds of thousands of protesters every week. They need money, by the way. I mean, they need money to run those protests. They're not free. There's sound systems and it costs money. We're going to give money to them. We're going to help the freedom movement in Israel. I want to ask you about your new book. You've written 13 books. This is the latest one. It's called Impossible Takes Longer. Subtitle is 75 years after its creation, has Israel fulfilled its founders' dreams? <laughs> Are you optimistic about the future of Israel? I'm very optimistic. You can be worried and optimistic at the same time. And I am worried and optimistic. Look, the book came out in April, which was really just a couple of months after this judicial reform thing started. And it was a very inopportune coalescence of events. You know, I don't think that the uh, publishers at HarperCollins are huge fans of the Likud party right now because it's embarked on this judicial platform that makes a lot of people wonder, really, you can talk about Israel being a success. So you can make all the obvious arguments about why Israel's not lived up to a lot of things. But look, let's what is, look what Israel has done. Uh, in, in 1948, when Ben-Gurion used to go to the United States and, and meet with people, and he would talk about Israel being the center of the Jewish world. You know, he was not exactly shy. And they would say to him, what are you talking about? I mean, it's we're happy for you. We're proud of it. It's cool. But it's less Jews than New York City. We're now the largest Jewish community in the world. And by 2048, more than half of the world's Jews will be Israelis. We have completely transformed the existential nature of what it means to be a Jew in the world. Jews in, in America, New York and Los Angeles, think differently about themselves than they did in 1951 even a couple of years after Israel's founding. Because Israel, especially after 67, gave the world a new sense of the Jew. You know, you and I have to really struggle to try to remember what it felt like to be a Jew in the years after the Holocaust. The image of the Jew was this emaciated, what was left of a human being in striped clothing behind barbed wire. Now that's history and it's sacred history and we need to remember it. But nobody thinks of the Jew that way anymore. And the Jew has been replaced by all the cutting edge technology and a, and a world ranked military, which tragically we need. I wish we didn't. What I tried to point out in the book, and what I did in the book, by the way, as you well know, is to use as the spine, so to speak, of the argument, the Declaration of Independence. Because many of us know exactly what it looks like. And it's 19 very small paragraphs. So you've never even read it. So what I did is I tried to show by each of the paragraphs what were the founders dreaming of, how far and amazingly, you know, We've come. Did they ever imagine a Tel Aviv like we have today? I, they, it's just, they, I mean, I, I, I take off from the airport, I look outside the window, and I see Tel Aviv, and I say, I just wish Ben Gurion could see this, because in his <laughs> wildest, in his wildest dreams, he would be appalled by the Knesset. He'd be upset about what's going on here, but he'd look at tech, he'd look at the army, he'd look at the economy. We've transformed what the Jewish people looks like, sounds like, feels like, does. That's an enormous success. Do I wish we weren't going through this very choppy wind right now? Of course I wish we weren't going through it. I think we'll see our way through it. I think we may come through it much stronger than we were. One has to be optimistic without being Pollyanna-ish, I think. Well, I say amen to that, and that is a fantastic way to end the podcast and also to anticipate hard work, but the blessings of uh, the year to come. Daniel Gordas, I want to thank you very, very much for this time together, and Shana Tova to you and yours. Shana Tova to you and yours as well. Thank you very much for the honor of being in conversation. Really a delight. Daniel Gordas has been one of the most important voices interpreting Israel for American Jews in the past two decades. I often look to him for guidance on what we in the West should be thinking about. I urge you to pay close attention to what he says, even if in the end you find yourself disagreeing with this or that point he made. And if you have agreed with so much of what he has said in the past and disagree now, you might ask yourself, what am I missing? Why are so many of Israel's most gallant defenders, people I looked up to through the years and quoted extensively, why are they now convinced that this domestic discord is the gravest threat to the character and future of Israel? a far more severe threat than any combination of foreign enemies. As Daniel emphasized, the current debate has long surpassed the issue of the proper balance of power between the three branches of government. What this struggle is really about is what do we mean when we proclaim Israel to be both Jewish and democratic? What do we mean by democracy? What do we mean by Jewish? And how do we resolve the friction between the two? For understandable reasons, Israel never fully resolved its founding tensions. She was born three years after the Holocaust. It was a difficult and dangerous birth. 
Her neighbors were determined to strangle the baby in its crib. Those were desperate times, when the future of the remnants of our people was weighed in the balance. In the years after barely winning independence, Israel brought in millions of persecuted Jews from every corner of the world, most from non-democratic countries, absorbed them with difficulty and unevenly, and developed the state piecemeal as best it could, all the while successfully defending itself from daily existential threats. There just wasn't enough time to articulate and legislate fundamental constitutional principles that had broad and popular support. The demands of daily survival took precedence. I hope that the silver lining of this crisis will be the opportunity to finally address the foundational principles of Israeli society. And as Daniel expressed, Israel emerges stronger for the experience. While it is for Israeli citizens alone to determine policies, world Jewry has an important role to play. Jews are bound to each other by the bonds of history and destiny. Kol Yisrael arevin all Jews are responsible one for the other. We too must be active in influencing the character of the Jewish state, mindful that it is Israelis who have the final say. We've been involved in this way since the first hour of Jewish statehood and even before. What transpires in Israel directly affects the future of the American Jewish community. If there's anyone who thinks that we can go on our merry way, turning our backs on Israel and living in splendid American isolation, never having to think of all of the messiness of Jewish statehood, you're deluded. The nature, character, and well-being of Israel will, in large part, determine the future of American Jewry. Even if you support every measure proposed by the Israeli government, and if you do, you're in the small minority. Still, the daily intensifying damage to Israel should concern you deeply. It is first and foremost the responsibility of the government to sustain basic social cohesion. It is the government that is empowered. It is the government that proposes legislation. Oppositions react to governments. And the Israeli government is tearing Israeli society apart and bringing world Jewry along for the dangerous ride. This is my severest disappointment. It's astonishing to me that no opposition, domestic or from Israel's friends in the world, seems to make any impact on the Israeli government. Prime Minister Netanyahu, who in the past avoided recklessness and used every skill at his disposal to ensure the health of Israel's economy and its military preparedness, seems suddenly to have been steamrolled by a coalition of politicians with half his skill and intelligence. What has gotten into Bibi? It is legitimate, even necessary, to debate the proper balance of power between the unelected judiciary and the elected legislature. Democracies engage this debate every day. Americans, too, have intense disagreements on this precise issue. But are you prepared to put at risk so much of what we have accomplished together in the past 75 years, all of which was achieved under the current judicial system? It's not the idea of judicial reform. It is this legislative package that the majority of Israelis, world Jewry, and Western governments oppose. Daniel expressed what I believe as well. That is, what makes this government different from all previous Israeli governments, and what makes finding broad social consensus so much more difficult, is that no government in Israel's past has included the kinds of extremist elements this coalition contains. Never before have such extreme forces had so much power. I despise extremism. It corrodes the free spirit and democratic fiber of a nation. Most of us don't really know what to do with zealots because they don't respond to reason and thus cannot be swayed with better arguments. As Winston Churchill once said, extremists never change their minds and never change the subject. Zealotry destroys everything good about society. There can be no prosperity, no arts, no letters, no industry, no discovery, no modernity without liberty and democracy. We will never excuse or rationalize Jewish supremacists, extremists, homophobes, theocrats, and religious fundamentalists. They do not speak for us. They do not represent us. They appall us. They distort Judaism and are an embarrassment to the Jewish people. They practice a kind of idolatry, a fixation on a few narrow statements in our tradition often taken out of context, the effect of which is to distract from and even contravene the overall spirit of Judaism. The highest urgency for all of us, including especially our modern Orthodox friends, is to diminish the influence these arrogant, puff-chested, ultra-nationalists and ultra-religious radicals have over Israel and the Jewish world. 
to push them back from the center of the political process, back to where they were for the past 75 years before the recent elections. At the same time, I urge you to resist the impulse some may have to shrug your shoulders and turn your back. We have an existential stake in the well-being and character of Israel. The Jewish state is the Jewish people's supreme creation of our era. It has injected the Jewish people back into history for the first time in two millennia. It has granted a persecuted, abandoned nation dignity, responsibility, and agency. The majority of the world's Jews live in Israel already. We cannot long sustain a strong, vital, and dynamic American Jewish community if we are alienated from the majority of our people. What then? If you are frustrated, if you are worried, if you are anxious, if you're angry, do something productive about it. Support in every way you know how the forces in Israel that reflect your values. Those marching weekly on the streets are amazing people. They are patriotic and filled with good Jewish and humane values. The stakes are enormous. This is a profound Jewish historical moment. Take inspiration from the sea of flags flooding Israeli streets for months on end and the tenacity of the flag bearers from all sectors of Israeli society, right and left, secular and religious, Ashkenazi and Sephardi, expressing the deepest love of country. Support them. Strengthen them. Hold them close to your hearts. Keep faith with this Israel. And I hope that Jews here in the West use this opportunity to recommit to those inspirational, humanitarian, democratic, Jewish, and Zionist principles that capture the imagination of the Jewish people and the respect of so many around the world. The State of Israel is the most miraculous place on earth. Do not take its existence or its accomplishments for granted. A Jewish state is a rare historical event. The last time we had a state was 2,000 years ago. We stand taller here because of what our brothers and sisters do over there. By finding a place in the sun for the Jewish people, Israel has granted every Jew a place in the sun. Until next time, this is In These Times.